Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. My name is Kathy Little, I'm the Client Relations Manager here at Product Space. We have a high demand quick buys topic today, which is object initialization rules, which are configurable rules that provide the definable identity, team role mappings, life cycle and revision scheme for newly created objects in Windchill. Also, we'd like to stay abreast of any difficulties or challenges you may be experiencing in this area so we can increase the overall knowledge for our shared PLM, PLM interests. If you want, you can send us a note at my email address, which is on your invite page, and we'd be happy to hear from you. As always, phones will be muted during the presentation, but you can post your questions in the chat room, and we'll answer them during the Q&A session. We will now begin our presentation with Ryan Porzell. Thank you, Kathy. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Kathy said, my name is Ryan Porzell. Uh, and I'm the Director of Services Operations here at Product Space. Um, so today we're going to go through some object initialization rules. Um, so from an agenda standpoint, um, we're going to take a look at what is an OIR and where do I find them. Uh, we'll see how to add new ones and modify ones that are already in the system. Um, we're going to take a look and see how the system prioritizes these OIRs as we go through. Um, we'll do an overview of some of the standard out-of-the-box OIRs, and we'll take a look at exactly what they do. Um, we'll take a look at a couple additions to the OIRs, something that's not necessarily um, readily available to everyone. Um, and then the last thing we'll do is we'll end with questions. Um, so the first thing we want to do is, is take a look at is what is an OIR. Um, so it stands for Object Initialization Rule. Um, and what it does is it defines the initial values for new objects. Uh, so, for instance, it defines the number. So if you happen to be use um, auto-generating numbers, um, it defines the life cycle that those objects are going to use, um, the team template, uh, version, folder location, and security labels. So, again, it defines all of the initial characteristics of all of these objects. Um, it can also determine, as we'll take a look at later, is it determines whether or not users can make changes to these values. Um, so, for instance, most of these um, remain with the object throughout their life, um, and it does take quite a bit of work to change um, some of these. Um, so we'll see how to allow users to make those changes. Um, it can be a, applied to a lifecycle managed object. Um, so some examples are CAD objects, um, documents, and parts. Um, again, so anytime you create a new object, um, these object initialization rules come into play. Um, so the question is, where do I find them? Um, so by default, when you install Windchill, um, each object type that's in the system will have an OIR established for it at the site level. Um, and again, those will filter down, and we'll take a look at how the system prioritizes those in a minute. Um, but new IRs can also be created um, at the site, org, or local context level. Um, so that would be anything from product, uh, library, or project. Um, so if we look at the priority of how this works is, um, anytime you create a new object, the system first looks for a local context level OIR. Um, if it doesn't exist, it goes then to the organization level and then lastly to the site level. Um, so anything that you create at the product level or the library level, um, that will override anything at any of the higher levels. Um, so again, by default, the site level has all of the OIRs defined to it. Um, if you define something and make a change to it, uh, at a product level, that will then overwrite um, those top two levels. Um, so taking a look at adding or modifying these OERs. Um, so to access them, you do that from the context, um, again, whether it's a product organization or, or site, um, and then you have your utilities area, and you should have an object initialization rule section. So if you click on that, you'll then see the image that you see here on your screen. Um, by right-clicking on the, on the name or the type, um, we'll give you this little pop-up menu that allow you to download it. So what this will do is it will download uh, an XML file that by default is going to be named rule.xml. Um, you can go ahead and change the name to anything you want then. Uh, at that point, you can open that XML file in a text editor and go ahead and make any of the modifications that you want. Um, so once you've made those modifications, um, there's two ways to get it back in the system. Um, one is if you happen to be creating a new OIR, um, either at the org or the product level, um, or you're creating, you have a subtype that you want to associate this new OIR to that subtype. 
Um, so you'll see a new icon uh, that you can create the new object initialization rule. Um, what I recommend doing is giving it the same name as one that you're either of the type um, or the one you're replacing at a lower level. Um, next thing you're going to do is select the object type or subtype that you're going to have it associated to. Um, and then you're going to browse your computer for the XML file that you're going to associate to that um, OIR type. Um, the second one is if you're updating an existing OIR that's already in the system, um, for the most part it's going to be the same thing. Um, you're just going to right click on the object and say edit. Um, but this time you don't actually have to pick the type. It's already going to be predefined for you. Uh, you just browse to that new XML file you've downloaded and that will then update it. Um, the nice thing about um, making changes to OIR is they are immediate. Um, there's no need to restart Windchill for the effects to take place. Um, so once you upload that new OIR, um, any new objects you create will be immediate. Um, here's sort of an example of what an OIR looks like. Uh, now this is opening this in Notepad++, um, so it does color code the XML file, so it's a little helpful here. Um, so in the next couple of steps, we'll go through a couple of these uh, snippets here and actually explain what they do. Um, again, going back to the priority. Um, again, all OERs out of the box are at the site level. Um, anything created at the organization level overrides those site ones. And then anything cr created at a local context overrides both the site and org. Um, so a couple examples here. Um, if we look at lifecycle. Uh, the site calls to the default lifecycle, but the organization has an OIR that says it uses a custom lifecycle, and therefore the new object will use the custom lifecycle. So again, it's just kind of a way to show how um, anything at the local context and how it works backwards in terms of which ones actually take precedence. Um, taking a look at some common OIR tags that you may have seen before. Um, the first one is defining the lifecycle. Um, so right here we see that in, in the red we have basic. This is where it actually calls to the lifecycle name that's in your lifecycle administrator. So if you want the object that you're creating to use a new lifecycle, you can go ahead and just change the, that red text and any new object will begin to use um, that new lifecycle. Now remember, this is only for new objects created. So if you change this OIR, it's not going to filter to all existing objects. Um, to do that, you'd have to reassign the lifecycle. And if you do a reassign lifecycle, it will look to the OIR and reassign it that way. Um, another thing that you might see a lot of is a version sequence. Um, so by default, you'll see this Harvard series here. Um, we've added state-based. So what that does is, is it, there is a loaded sequence in the database, uh, and it's broken out into sections. So again, depending on how your life cycle is determined, um, we told it to use a state-based version sequence. Um, another one is default location. Um, so if you look at your OIRs, uh, you'll have slash default in there as the default location of all objects. Um, if you want all new cat objects or all new documents to default to a specific folder, you can set that here in the OIR, and that will automatically set it there by default. Um, that doesn't mean that the users can't change that. It just helps them with the default location. Uh, what we've also seen done with OIRs is people set a default folder um, that they've created on a different domain, and they've um, restricted all access in that domain. Um, so what it does is it now forces the users to pick a folder um, rather than just randomly check it in anywhere they want. Um, the last common OER tag is the number. Um, so what we have here is uh, it's a number generator. Uh, so in the database, we have a sequence defined. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to create our WT document number that's going to have um, 10 characters. Uh, so again, you can adjust this if you want to change your number generator um, or change the length of the number characters. Um, that's determined by this uh, tag here. Um, the next one we'll take a look at uh, is some additional OIR changes that you might uh, not be fully aware of. Um, anytime you see this get immutable constraint tag in here, uh, what that does is it prevents users from being able to change the values. Uh, so for instance, um, if it's on number and they go to do a rename, um, number's going to be grayed out. So they're not going to be able to update the number of an object. 
if you comment this line out, um, going forward, users will be able to make a change uh, to the number field. Um, also, there's another tag that you may want to set um, that allows you to automatically set the name and the number equal to each other. So by adding this second string in there, it automatically sets the name equal to number uh, during a SCAD operation. Uh, if you've done a save as in the past, you'll notice that for CAD documents, there's three fields that need to be entered. Um, and if you're trying to go for a unique value um, for all three, uh, there's always that risk of somebody mistyping one of the three values um, or they have to cut and paste and so forth. So this kind of takes the uh, risk away from them accidentally typing in the wrong value. Um, you can also see preferences uh, tied in with this uh, OIR to automatically set file name equal to number as well. So that way if you do a save as operation, users only have to type in one value rather than the other three. Um, another thing you can do is you can configure OIR from external locations. Um, so you can use a corporate number generator. So you can tell the OIR to go to that corporate number generator and get the values from there. Um, you can also have a predefined list of numbers um, on, your, on your system. Um, and see some of the different options that you can add to it um, that may not be there out of the box. Um, another one is using conditional logic. Um, so what we see here is an added attribute. Um, so what it does is, is it looks to an attribute that exists on it. And depending on what the value is, it, it determines the number that it's going to be used. So for instance, um, it looks to this attribute. Um, if value is A through F, then it takes the first line. So what it does, it numbers it with 10 characters. Um, if it does not satisfy the A through F uh, value, then it takes the second argument, which is only five length. So again, this um, so some OER best practices. Um, the first one is, you know, um, for the most part, all of these uh, object types already have an OER at the site level. So if you intend to either create one for a subtype, or you want to create one at an org level or a uh, Level, download the one from the site level. There's no reason to recreate them and just make your modifications to those. Um, create OIRs only at org level and local context level as needed. For the vast majority of people, site level OIRs is more than enough, and usually you want that to be for all of your products and libraries. Um, so again, only create those at the org level or context level as needed. Um, remember the definitions are inherited, so you only have to add the components of the OIR that you intend to change. Um, so as you saw in the, in the brief um, image, there are a lot of different sections in those OIRs. You only need to add the section that you're modifying at lower level context. Um, always save the initially downloaded OIR in case you need to revert back. Um, if you happen to uh, download an OIR, make changes to it and upload it, if you, if you find that there's a problem or there's something wrong with it and you need to revert back, if you didn't save it, you have to go ahead and either find another one or figure out a way to revert it. Um, also, what we like to do is add comments to your OIRs. Um, again, if you use the XML comment tags, you can add those additional comments in there so people later on can come here and tell um, either what for or what you did it for. Um, so it's just a good way of letting others know um, why you added it. Okay, at this time I'll turn it over to Kathy for any questions. Presentation today, because there weren't any questions posted in the chat room, but uh, you should see a poll on your screen, and we would certainly appreciate you taking just a moment to um, answer that for us. And also, um, thank you for your participation today. Feel free to call us anytime here at Product Space. We'd love to hear from you. If you have a topic you would like covered in our Quick Bites, you can submit it on our invite page. And as always, you can view all of our Quick Bite sessions on our web page. Just a second, someone did just enter a question for us, so we will go back to Q&A. 
First question is, what is the syntax for creating the file OIR for save as? Um, that's a great question, and let me actually uh, let me go back there. Um, um, so for the save as, um, it's actually here. If you can see my screen, um, so as long as you enter that information there, that's going to set the name and the number of uh, value fields equal to each other. Okay, I think that does conclude our questions. Uh, thank you for that information, Ryan, and thank you everyone for your participation. Uh, as I was saying previously, uh, you can view all our Quick Bytes sessions on our webpage at quickbytes.windchill360.com and register for our next topic, which is designing a secure user authentication framework for Windchill. Thanks everyone. Have a great week.